This episode is brought to you by DirecTV Stream. Introducing DirecTV Stream, the best of live TV and on demand, which means you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. So whether you want to catch the game live or watch the latest blockbuster, they've got you covered. And there's no annual contract. DirecTV Stream. Get your TV together at directtv.com. Requires high-speed internet and compatible device. Content varies by package and location. Restrictions apply. The Troubles is the name generally attributed to the 30-year period of violence in Northern Ireland, which saw multiple sides and organisations waging war against each other. There were bombings, shootings, sniper attacks, human bombs, RPG attacks, and many stories of informers and spies. The Troubles podcast explains the events that occurred during that time, devoting one episode to each incident. It's a non-partisan, historical true crime podcast that explores the motivations and planning behind the attacks. The podcast is a great entry point for those who want to learn about such a volatile period in history. This season, we've already covered when members of the IRA went over to train FARC rebels on how to make mortars in Colombia, as well as the story of Captain Robert Nyrak, a British soldier who went undercover in an Irish pub, and after getting up on stage and singing rebel songs, he was discovered to be a soldier and taken away and violently murdered by the Republicans. Episodes are released every two weeks and are narrated by me. You can find the podcast by searching The Troubles Podcast on all major podcast platforms, including Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Thanks and see you there. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 2, Episode 35 The Solemn League and Covenant Welcome back to Pax Britannica. I'm your host, Samuel Hume. Firstly, thank you to Yaramir for your very generous PayPal donation. Last week, we saw the First Battle of Newbury, which was the high watermark of the Royalist cause. After a brutal but indecisive battle, Charles I withdrew from the field and let the Parliamentarian commander, the Earl of Essex, lead his army back to safety in London. We also covered the cessation of arms, the one-year truce which the King agreed with the Confederate Irish government of Kilkenny. For Charles, the cessation allowed him to withdraw several thousand English soldiers from his western kingdom. For the Confederates, it meant they could focus on their other enemies, especially the Scottish Covenanter army, led by Major General Robert Munro. But whatever benefits Charles gained from the cessation, they would soon be overshadowed. Because finally, after years of mutual sympathies, backroom dealings, treasonous agreements, and open negotiations, the English Parliament made a formal alliance with the Scottish Covenanters, the Solemn League and Covenant. For the roots of the Solemn League and Covenant, we have to go back months, to early 1643, and as fair warning, we're going to mention a lot of groups, assemblies, committees, and councils, because every good revolution needs a revolutionary council, or seven. Ever since Charles fled London in January 1642, the Covenanter government had been divided on the question of England. Would Scotland remain neutral and leave English affairs to the English? Or should they intervene? And if so, on which side? The obvious choice for their support were the English parliamentarians. The Hunto leadership was already on friendly terms with the Covenanters. Now, during his visit to Scotland, Charles had extracted promises from the leading Scottish nobles including Argyle and the Earl of Loudoun, that whatever happened in England, they would not intervene. The king had kindly reminded Loudoun of this promise in a letter sent shortly after Charles fled London in 1642. But Loudoun countered in his own letter. The promise was based on a mutual acceptance of the peace treaty, which included an act of oblivion, essentially it pardoned the Covenanters from any crimes, including, I don't know, rebellion and waging war against the king. Charles had accepted this at the time, but when the king charged the five members with inciting a Scottish invasion and seized their correspondence, it threatened the act of oblivion. If the five members had committed a crime by inviting the army of the Covenant into England, 
What about the men who'd answered the call? Loudon refused to abide by the promise he'd made. As far as he was concerned, Charles had broken the agreement. The affairs of England were the affairs of Scotland too, and Scotland would decide what to do about it. The Scottish Privy Council was divided on the question. Neutrality risked the resurgence of Charles's desire to dominate Scotland and bring its church into alignment with the English, and the series of royalist successes during 1643 only fanned those fears. Everyone knew that the king despised the terms that had been forced on him after the Bishop's Wars and at the Parliament of 1641. He'd only accepted them because he had no other choice. But if the king crushed Parliament, not only would they have lost their closest ally, but the king would presumably be in a strong military position. In a worst-case scenario, Charles would have the means to enforce his will on Scotland once and for all, and he would do so with a pacified England behind him. The Marquis of Argyle, the leading nobleman among the Covenanters, was firmly on the side of aiding the English Parliament, and he played a central role in bringing Covenanter Scotland to Parliament's aid. He successfully convinced the Scottish Privy Council that any question of intervention in the English Civil War should be debated alongside two other bodies, which had been established during the King's visit in 1641, the Committee for Common Burdens and the Conservatives of the Peace. This was against the wishes of the Duke of Hamilton, who was still attempting to maintain the King's interests as best he could. Argyle also managed to persuade the Privy Council that instead of the three groups meeting to debate, and then leaving to vote separately, they should all vote together. Why did this matter? Because Argyle's allies held the majority in both the Committee and the Conservators of the Peace. So when the Privy Council, the Committee of Common Burdens, and the Conservators of the Peace met on the 11th and 12th of May, 1643, they all agreed, or at least Argyle's allies agreed, and that was enough, that since the King was refusing to summon a Parliament, they would summon a Convention of Estates as a substitute and the Convention would decide what to do about England. The Convention would meet on the 22nd of June, and Argyle's majority support from the Shire Commissioners and the Burgesses outnumbered the votes of the nobility, many of which rallied behind Hamilton. It was already looking like Hamilton would have his work cut out for him. He'd have to try and convince a hostile audience that the King's word could be trusted, and that the English Parliament could not. And then Hamilton's entire argument was taken out at the knees with the capture of the Earl of Antrim and his papers. These spelled out a royalist conspiracy to rise up and overthrow the Covenanters by force. So much for trusting the king. Argyle didn't pass up this opportunity. Two of the nobles implicated in the plot, the Viscounts Nithsdale and de Boyne, were indicted for fermenting rebellion. When it became clear that the convention was overwhelmingly against him, Hamilton marched out on the 26th. Soon after, the convention voted to invite commissioners from London in order to discuss closer ties between the two kingdoms. English parliamentarians, including Henry Vane Jr., arrived in Edinburgh, and Scottish Covenanters travelled south to attend and advise the Westminster Assembly of Divines. Now what on earth is the Westminster Assembly of Divines? Since the 12th of June, 1643, the Westminster Assembly of Divines had been gathered to consider the further reformation of the Church of England. They held their meetings in Westminster Abbey, hence the name, and their membership included over 120 ministers, selected to represent counties across England, as well as MPs and Lords. Now, you might assume that this was something that most parliamentarians would agree with. After all, one of the key grievances of the parliamentary opposition after the personal rule was that the Church of England had strayed from its Reformation roots. But in this, of course, there were divisions. There were those who believed that the pre-Stuart Church, stripped of all its Laudian innovations and returned to the standards of the Elizabethan settlement, was the one and true Church. Generally speaking, we don't hear much of this perspective from parliamentarians. Charles and the Royalists had effectively won these people over to their side in the print war, by abandoning Lord and his innovations. There were still some religious moderates, or perhaps conformists, on the parliamentary side, but we won't see much of them in the Assembly. The other two positions are much more visible, much more influential, and they're going to be with us for a while. The Presbyterian faction 
and the Independent faction. Firstly, the Presbyterians. Of course, we've heard a lot about Presbyterianism in Scotland, and so I won't repeat myself, but the main points are no bishops, a far less hierarchical system of church government centred on church elders, local and general assemblies, strict moral and theological discipline, and a national church. Many English Puritans, especially the reformists we spoke about many moons ago, advocated for a similar system of Calvinism to their northern neighbour. The other perspective was actually many, but it's easiest to group them together under a single label, the independents. Generally speaking, the independents believed that the Church of England was wrong to try and enforce an orthodoxy on Protestants at all, the independents argued that there should be freedom of religion for all Protestants, not Catholics, obviously, and congregations should be able to worship as their conscience dictated and be independent of each other, hence the label, the independents. Obviously, these two theological positions had very little middle ground between them. One wanted strict uniformity under a Presbyterian system, the other wanted freedom of worship for Protestants. Is this complicated enough yet? Well, now we have to talk politics. Because alongside these religious factions, Parliament was divided into political factions. On one side were the Peace Party. They were in favour of coming to a negotiated settlement with the King. Compromise had to be possible. The Civil War was bad for everyone. Even the King, stubborn as he was, had to know that. They spearheaded the efforts to negotiate with the King, and had since the war began. Opposite the Peace Party was, what else, the War Party. They wanted to continue the war until even the King, stubborn as he was, knew that he was beaten. Then Parliament could enforce whichever peace terms they desired. And between the two was the so-called Middle Group, which kept the other two in check. John Hamden had been one of its leaders, and his death robbed the moderates of a powerful voice. Now, of course, I should say that these are just useful shorthands. These aren't political parties in the modern sense. They were alliances and networks of influence which shifted according to the times. These factions will, like the religious divisions, remain in our narrative for quite some time to come, though their membership and aims will change. Both types of faction, religious and political, intersected. In fact, David Como suggests that the question of religion had been put to one side by the parliamentarians as they focused on winning the war. With the summoning of the Westminster Assembly, and the commitment Parliament will soon make in the Solemn League and Covenant, those questions couldn't be put off any longer. Positions had to be stated. Arguments won. This was, after all, more than a question of peace and war. It wasn't even a matter of just life and death. It was the question of the immortal souls of all of England. As Coma puts it, quote, Religious divisions spread, first in London, then into the armies and countryside. For many months, impulses towards parliamentarian unity stifled these conflicts, keeping them from seriously distorting parliamentary politics and the war effort. But by late 1644, divisions became impossible to suppress, and England's nascent religious schisms intersected with earlier political programmes and divisions. End quote. When Parliament agreed to convene the Westminster Assembly, a group of MPs and Lords signed a letter, destined for Massachusetts Bay Colony, to request the attendance of John Cotton, Thomas Hooker, and John Davenport. Now those are names we haven't heard for a while. They would refuse the invitation, however, which David Como puts down to their unwillingness to become magnets of controversy. They were apparently aware that the parliamentary religious front was far from unified. They also had their own concerns in the colonies, which we'll cover another time. Back to the Covenanters. When their commissioners arrived in London on the 7th of August to attend the Westminster Assembly, they made a point not to be seen to be dictating the reform of the English Church. They were advisers only. When it was suggested that the Scots be admitted as full members of the Assembly, they declined. They were just here to advise. At one point they insisted, quote, We were well content the Assembly should take their own order, and not tie themselves to ours, end quote the Church of England would be reformed by the English. The Scots were just there to advise. But of course, the commissioners were there to advise the English to choose Presbyterianism. It was vital to Scotland's national and spiritual security 
that England join them in the Presbyterian system. Otherwise, a post-Civil War England would once again be in a position to enforce its church on the Scots. So through the legitimate procedures of the Assembly, the commissioners worked to convince and persuade their southern neighbours of the benefits of the Kirk system. They helpfully provided a published book which detailed how the Scottish Kirk worked and why it was so beneficial for a godly society. And at this point they could take this softly softly approach. The Presbyterians were the majority in both the Assembly and the Parliament. The opponents of the Scottish model, the Independents, were outnumbered handily in both. But the Presbyterians wouldn't have the upper hand forever. This episode is brought to you by Death on the Nile, exclusively in theaters February 11th. The greatest detective of all time, Hercule Poirot, returns to solve another deadly case. Join Poirot on a wild ride down the Nile River, promising luxury, intrigue, and murder. Grab your friends and get ready to solve this murder mystery on the big screen. Starring Kenneth Branagh and Gal Gadot. Premiering only in theaters February 11th. This episode is brought to you by Cox Home Life. Cox helps make your home smarter and your life easier. And now you can use your Contour voice remote to connect to your home life cameras. So you can view them right on your TV screen using simple voice commands. That makes it easy to keep tabs on what's happening around your home right from your couch. Need to keep an eye on the kids when they're playing outside? Just say, show me my backyard camera into your Cox voice remote and watch them while you're in the house. If you're waiting for a delivery and want to make sure it's there on time, no problem. Say, show me my driveway camera to check on it with your Home Life HD cameras on the TV screen while you go about your day. When you live in a home powered by Cox Internet, you can stay connected to what matters and let Cox take care of the rest. To learn more about all the benefits of your connected home, Visit cox.com slash this is home. Back in Scotland, the convention drafted the Solemn League and Covenant and the Treaty of Military Assistance, and they were ratified by the Convention of Estates and the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland on the 17th of August. The two were often conflated, then and now, as a single item, and it is hard to separate them. In a sense, the Solemn League and Covenant was the price for the Treaty of Military Assistance. It bound the signatories to preserving Presbyterianism in Scotland and the reform of the Church of England. Once it reached the English Parliament, it would be amended to also include the Church of Ireland too. It was essentially the reverse of Charles's policy which had sparked all of this. Instead of Scotland's Church becoming more English, the English Church would become more Scottish. Henry Vane Jr., who we haven't seen on the podcast for a while now, was one of the commissioners sent by London to negotiate the alliance. Vane was determined to see Scottish troops aid Parliament, but he was firmly in the independent camp, and he balked at the Solemn League and Covenant's implication that England would gain a Presbyterian church. Before the document was passed by the convention, including the call for the reformation of religion in the Church of England according to the example of the best reformed churches, Vane managed to have the phrase, according to the word of God, added. This was usefully ambiguous. Without the Vane clause, the implication was that, since the document stated that the Kirk didn't need any more reform, the Kirk was therefore the best reformed church, and so the English and Irish churches should be modelled on the Scottish one. With the Vane Clause, independence in the English Parliament, like Vane himself, would be able to use this wordplay to avoid committing to a Presbyterian system. They could argue the case based on scripture. But the Covenanters weren't blind or naive. They knew fine well what this edit meant, and they'd do everything they could to stop the English independence using that loophole. Internally, the Solemn League and Covenant was something of a test for Argyle's government, a trial of its strength and resolve. They were once again going to war with their king. For known Scottish royalists, as well as some wavering Covenanters, this was unacceptable. Montrose, who was in Oxford with the king, would find himself ascendant in Charles's eyes. 
After all, he'd warned the king that a passive approach in Scotland would not keep the Covenanters out of his hair. Montrose would soon be heading back across the border with a commission from his king. But not before he welcomed the Duke of Hamilton into Oxford in what must have been a wonderful moment of petty revenge. Charles was furious with his leading Scottish noble. He had been wrong to push for peace, and his arrogant belief that he could forge a moderate faction among the Covenanters had backfired spectacularly. Hamilton had certainly been overconfident, and he'd misread the Scottish situation, but his cause was hardly helped by his king's two-faced policies. He'd gone to Edinburgh, confident that he had the king's backing for his strategy, and that Charles wouldn't do anything silly to completely undermine him. He might have succeeded. Might. But then the Antrim papers were captured, and the royalist plot was exposed, and that was the end of that. For his efforts, Hamilton fell. He fell hard. Both he and his brother Lanark were arrested the instant they arrived at Oxford, where Montrose gleefully accused him of treason. Hamilton was stripped of all court titles, Prince Rupert replaced him as the king's master of horse, and he was shipped off to Pendennis Castle in Cornwall. Hamilton would spend the next two years imprisoned as far away from the king as possible. Montrose would finally get what he wanted, a commission from the king to take the fight to the Covenanters. When the Solemn League and Covenant and the Treaty of Military Assistance reached the English Parliament, the response was divided. Scottish military assistance would be wonderful, almost everyone agreed with that, but not everyone thought the price was worth it. The intervention of the Covenanters into the war would firstly make any negotiated peace with the king more difficult, because the Scots would naturally want a say in that peace. They were the professionals when it came to peace treaties with the king, after all, as long as you don't base it on how long the treaties of Berwick and London actually lasted. If a compromise between the king and the English parliament was possible, it might not be with the addition of the Scots. A deal which satisfies two parties is a lot easier than a deal which satisfies three. The peace party were especially concerned that Scottish intervention would actually extend the war rather than shorten it. The independents were the most sceptical of the alliance for obvious religious reasons. Even with the vain clause, the spirit of the Solemn League and Covenant was clearly intended to mean the Presbyterian reform of the Church of England and the imposition of Presbyterianism in Ireland. For those independents who supported the alliance for military reasons, the vain clause gave them hope for a more tolerant reformation. But they didn't like it, and the hostility of the independents will strain relations with the Scots going forward. Then there was the fear that a Scottish intervention would open the floodgates, and the English Civil War would become another front in the Thirty Years' War. Now, many historians do make the case that the Wars of the Three Kingdoms are the offshore theatre of the European conflict, but this is less to do with direct intervention by foreign powers. Perhaps accepting the offer of the Scots would prompt those foreign powers to take an interest in Charles's domestic troubles. What if, for example, the government of Charles's nephew, Louis XIV, the four-year-old who would one day be the Sun King, decided to intervene? If the Bourbon got involved, how would other powers react? The fear among some MPs was that inviting the Scots into England once again would set a chain of events into motion which would lead to foreign armies turning green and pleasant England into a wasteland. However, the counter to this argument came with a cessation. Charles had already broken that taboo, bringing armies from Ireland into England, and he'd already begged his relatives for help to no avail. The alliance with Edinburgh would just balance the scales. On top of all of this, we have to add a dash of traditional English prejudice against the Scots, combined with a genuine pride in their own church. Just as the Scots resented Charles's attempt to make the Church of Scotland more like the Church of England, many English, even those with serious problems with the present Church of England, didn't want their church changed by the Scots. But despite all this opposition, Pym easily managed to push the alliance through Parliament. The debates came on the heels of a series of parliamentary defeats. Through July, August and the first half of September, the King's forces had, 
captured Bradford, defeated Waller at Lansdowne, defeated him again at Roundway Down, and destroyed his army, captured Bristol, recaptured Gainsborough, besieged Gloucester, besieged Hull, and captured Exeter. The cessation of arms was signed on the 15th of September, sparking fears of large numbers of Irish reinforcements for the king. Newbury was celebrated, but it wasn't a crushing defeat which might clearly herald a reversal for Parliament. Whatever their opposition to the Solemn League and Covenant, the Treaty of Military Assistance might be the only thing that would keep their heads on their shoulders. On the 25th of September, both Parliament and the Westminster Assembly ratified the treaties. In return for £30,000 a month and the promises of the Solemn League and Covenant, Edinburgh would dispatch Alexander Leslie, Earl of Leathern, into England at the head of the new 22,000-man strong army of the Solemn League and Covenant. The English Civil War was now, truly, a war of three kingdoms. Thank you to my House of Lords, which has been joined by Eric, Baron Derochet, Christopher, Baron Meadowcroft. They, like every patron, regardless of rank, received an RSS feed which you can put into any podcast app to listen to the podcast ad-free. Thank you to everyone who has supported me on Patreon, left a review, and especially told a friend about the podcast. That is one of the best ways to help a podcast grow. While you wait for next week's episode, why don't you give The Troubles podcast a listen? It's like jumping forwards three centuries in the Irish story, and it's a perfect example of how the events we cover on PAX can still be felt today. You can find The Troubles on every good podcast app and Spotify. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music used in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening.